of the National Environmental Law Association, welcome to this opening session of our 2021 National Conference. I'm speaking from Ngunnawal Country, Canberra. Neela pays our respects to First Nations elders across Australia, past, present and emerging. Our focus over the next four Friday afternoons will be, are our environmental laws fit for purpose? Neela says no. For those new to a Neil event, Neela is a peak body for advancing Australian environmental law. We achieve this primarily by offering high quality in-person and virtual events and making recommendations to law reform inquiries. Neela brings together professionals in environment and natural resources law and related disciplines. It's for anyone interested in environmental law. This afternoon, we have several eminent speakers. The Honourable Justice Nicola Payne from the Land and Environment Court of New South Wales, Dr Robert Niven, Associate Professor at UNSW ADFA, and Peter Cochran, Regional Councillor, uh, Regional Councillor Oceania for the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. Our first two speakers will reflect on the topic National Environmental Law Accountability and the need for a National Environmental Protection Authority. Peter Cochran will conclude the session with an IUCN up update. As NILA members may know, NILA is an NGO IUCN member, while various government agency in the, is, agencies in Australia are members of IUCN's government house. We have provided the speakers abstracts and profiles in the first delegates handbook that have been emailed to you and you will be receiving delegates handbooks for the next three sessions of this four session national conference. So to save time, I'm not going to repeat that information. Briefly, some housekeeping. As mentioned, we are recording this web webinar. So hide your video if you don't want to be captured inadvertently. We will be making a, a recording available via our website to registrants to, and that will take you to Neela's YouTube channel. Uh, we aim to have time for questions at the end of presentation. So if you have a question, please pop it into the chat box at the bottom of your screen. And uh, I'll moderate those. The speakers should be able to see those as they come in uh, and they may self-select questions as well. So over to you, Justice Payne. Thank you. Thank you very much, Daniela, for the opportunity to speak on this topic. I think I've been asked because in a much earlier uh, life, I was in fact at the Commonwealth Environment Protection Agency, as it then was, which existed for a relatively brief period between 1992 and 1996, uh, before its functions were folded back into the, then I think it was art, sport and, and the environment. Um, so this topic has been an opportunity to revisit sort of federal state relations on the environment, which is something that I've isn't my daily bread and butter, but um, is a topic of great interest to me. So thank you. I do want to acknowledge I am on the traditional lands of the Gadigal people of the Aura Lake Nation, and I pay my respects to their elders past, present and future. And I now am hopefully going to successfully share screen with you all. You will as soon as I make you a co-host, Justice Payne, just bear with me. Yes, you're now co-host. Thank you. Thank you. So I gave myself the very broad topic of conceptualising a Commonwealth or National Environment Protection Authority. And although a lot of the discussion does focus on a Commonwealth EPA, so to speak, I think it is useful to think about the topic from the point of view of whether it's a, a national body, a uh, truly national body that we need uh, to discuss or uh, a more Commonwealth focused body. And hopefully that'll be drawn out in some of the comments I make. Essentially, this is a huge topic because it involves really asking what is the role of the Commonwealth in the federal system of government in Australia. And unfortunately, of course, I won't have time to do that. I will not have time, unfortunately, look at all at the marine environment or at heritage laws, um, both Indigenous and non-Indigenous heritage laws. The Commonwealth are a very topical matter at the moment, but I'm just not going to have time or frankly, nor do I have the expertise um, to deal with them in the time that I have. <coughs> 
What I thought I could usefully address is can an independent national EPA assist in achieving the Commonwealth's uh, main env environmental responsibilities as they appear in the EPBC Act, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, that being the Act which identifies matters of national environmental significance. Secondly, but related is does the recent enhancement of the statutory, now statutory body, the Inspector General of Water Compliance under the Commonwealth Water Act provide a useful guide of what is possible? Um, that has been quite interesting development and only came into effect from the 5th of August, 2021. So it's far too early days to say how it's going to pan out, so to speak, but I do want to talk a bit about that legal structure. Last but certainly not least is should an independent Commonwealth EPA regulate Commonwealth government activities on Commonwealth government owned land and uh, particularly the Department of Defence springs to mind. Uh, I'm not going to spend too long on that because I know that uh, Associate Professor Niven will be spending a lot of time on that so I'll make some very brief remarks but uh, essentially he'll be talking a lot about that topic I understand. So if you are talking about a, an EPA, an Environment Protection Authority, as opposed to an agency, um, what are the some of the things you might uh, expect to see? So just because I'm most familiar with it, I've just put up some background essentially on the Protection of the Environment Administration Act in New South Wales, under which the EPA in New South Wales is set up. So I just wanted to stress, of course, it is a body corporate set up by statute. It has objectives, functions, powers, Importantly, it has some duties relating to environmental quality. Uh, one of those duties has been the topic of a recent decision by the Chief Judge. Um, it is subject to the control of the Minister in except in some very important respects. And those are things like reporting, making recommendations to the Minister, the State of Environment reporting, and also importantly, the institution of criminal or related proceedings. It does have a board and the functions of the board are set out and the board is not able to be uh, dictated to by the minister either. Uh, but there is a chair who um, is subject to the direction of the minister. So it's just one example of what a statutory independent authority uh, might look like. And uh, basically I'll be saying that nothing like this exists certainly at the moment at the Commonwealth level. In terms of some of the regu regulatory functions of New South Wales EPA, those of you who practice in New South Wales will be well familiar with these, but it undertakes environmental protection licensing, uh, it monitors compliance under the Protection of the Environment Operations Act, and it has a very, um, I think, on the whole, well prosecuted in compliance and enforcement program, which includes, of course, the imposition of fines, the issuing of notices and prosecuting organisations and individuals and can order a pollution cleanup. I'm going to mention contamination because that just is something I want to briefly mention in relation to the Department of Defence uh, in, in a little while. And basically there are extensive powers for the EPA under the Contaminated Land Management Act, including the declaration of sites as significantly contaminated with the power to issue orders that something be done about it. And most importantly, these powers apply equally to public and private entities in New South Wales. So public and private entities are regularly prosecuted for criminal matters uh, in the New South Wales Land and Environment Court and the local court for, for less serious matters. Now, of course, nothing like this does exist at the Commonwealth level, um, whether it should, frankly, I'm not going to be able to answer, but it's interesting to see how the statutory authority of New South Wales has quite significant compliance and enforcement mechanisms available. And certainly at the, at the state level, criminal enforcement of environmental laws is very common. And that is something that is far less common at the Commonwealth level and is something certainly worth commenting about. Um, of course, the Commonwealth has a large number of bodies engaged on environmental uh, matters. Um, I could mention the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority is one example. Um, the Murray-Darling Basin uh, is another. Um, there is an offshore petroleum uh, body which regulates offshore petroleum, for example. But um, given the, the limited time I've got, um, I just want to focus particularly on the Environment Protection Biodiversity Conservation Act, not least because it's just been subject to a, a fairly recent and somewhat scathing review, I'd have to say, about how things are working at the Commonwealth level. So as I'm sure many of you are aware, there is a diverse range of matters of national environmental significance and in relation to any of these, if an activity in the state uh, or territory is likely to have a significant impact on that matter, then there has to be a referral to the uh, Commonwealth 
uh, the relevant department it would be, uh, and an assessment and an approval is issued. Uh, but of course, one of the issues is how are those conditions monitored and enforced by the Commonwealth? Uh, and I'll leave aside for the moment um, that there are, of course, responsibilities in relation to the approval of Commonwealth land. Things certainly are complicated for the Commonwealth in implementing these obligations and Ramsar is one very good example of that. So Ramsar wetlands, as I'm sure many of you know, are wetlands of international significance, often because of their importance to migratory bird species. There are currently approximately 66 of these nominated um, under the International Convention across Australia. 16 are located in the Murray-Darling Basin uh, and many of them straddle both public and private land and will be largely found in uh, areas that would otherwise fall under state and territory jurisdiction, not directly Commonwealth land. So that does require a high level of cooperation between the Commonwealth and state and territory governments in that regard. Now, um, there has been quite a lot of critical comment made about the uh, lack of what general protection for Ramsar wetlands as between the Commonwealth and states where that level of cooperation breaks down. So this would be one area of complexity if you were looking at having a statutory body to devise appropriate laws um, would, would be, I think, quite challenging, but uh, certainly something I would suggest needs to be done. Interestingly, for Ramsar wetlands in the Murray-Darling Basin, there is quite specific provisions in the Water Act Commonwealth, which of course is essentially what's regulating the Murray-Darling Basin, um, to try and ensure that Ramsar uh, values are protected through sufficient water. Not always practically successful, but certainly the legal structure is there to uh, ensure that these wetlands are appropriately, um, uh, do have enough water in them, putting it bluntly. Now, interestingly, there's been relatively little civil enforcement of the EBC Act over its period. One of the very few uh, cases that my willing team of uh, researchers did find was the Green Tree litigation, which is now 2004, 2005. So a farmer in New South Wales was clearing, clearing Ramsar land and the Minister for Environment um, they did take a success, uh, successful, I should say, injunction proceedings in the federal court and also successfully got pecuniary penalties imposed um, and ultimately the appeal by the farmer was dismissed. But this is one of the very few uh, examples of enforcement by the Minister of the EPBC Act. Most of the enforcement tends to have been by third parties, NGOs and individuals in particular. And so I'm stressing both the paucity of these kinds of actions by the Minister, uh, but also that it's civil enforcement rather than criminal, which seems to be the preference for um, enforcement at the Commonwealth level compared to say the state where there is really quite a lot of enforcement of criminal matters. Um, I'm able to say a lot of these things because of the recent independent review of the EPBC Act um, by Professor Graham Samuel and uh, his colleagues. Uh, the report was published in October 2020 and makes for somewhat sobering reading. I've done a quick summary there of some of the uh, findings made in a particular chapter on compliance and enforcement as you can see, it was found that the implementation was inconsistent, underutilized, under-resourced, lacked transparency, and generally there was a weak compliance and enforcement culture, um, which uh, has been um, obviously a concern to a number of organizations such as NILA over a long time. So the Samuels Review has proposed some new uh, uh, entities, I, should, I suppose I should call them. One of them is an Environment Assurance Commissioner um, who would oversee and audit Commonwealth government agency um, responsibilities under the EPBC Act, including what's called a new Office of Compliance and Enforcement, um, which was another recommendation made that is in recommendation 30 of the uh, independent review recommendations. So recommendation 30 says that a new independent Office of Compliance and Enforcement should be set up within the Department of Agriculture, Water and the Environment. It's supposed to have modern regulatory powers and tools, which is possibly concerning that in 2021 it hasn't got them, to enable it to deliver compliance and enforcement of Commonwealth approvals, consistent with new national environmental standards for compliance and enforcement. And I'm particularly stressing national environmental standards because it's one of the key, probably the centrepiece of this independent review is the need for the Commonwealth government to pass these standards in various shapes and forms. Uh, to better uh, have, a, have better protection under the EPBC Act. So 
the actual reform proposed is, is actually very fundamental, uh, even separate from the compliance and enforcement, which is what I'm focusing on. So the Commonwealth Government has done a response to the independent review um, in the pathway for reforming national environmental law uh, produced this year in June 2021. It's actually a reasonably short document and I suppose from my point of view in this topic doesn't really make any effective mention of monitoring and compliance. Uh, a bill has now been introduced, uh, which has just had a second reading speech early in August um, to create the National Environmental uh, Standards Body, uh, sorry, the Environmental Assurance um, uh, Commissioner, and also set up the framework for these national environmental standards. Um, but certainly there's no mention of any sort of independent statutory body, such as I've pointed out, exist in New South Wales and uh, in many other um, states. So um, I've one, wanted to mention one other area of quite sub very substantial work by the Australian Panel of Experts on Environmental Law and uh, their environmental technical governance technical paper makes a very interesting reading um, because this very eminent group of environmental lawyers has laboured long and hard to propose um, really a, a scheme for some uh, a, a whole new framework for environmental law. And it's interesting to see what is proposed by that body uh, in terms of new entities. So they propose that a Commonwealth Environment Commission be established to undertake strategic environmental instrument development, uh, partly from a basis of thinking that uh, strategic uh, thinking, uh, sorry, strategic direction is lacking at the Commonwealth level. They propose a Commonwealth EPA to ensure compliance and also a Commonwealth Environmental Auditor, uh, which has some overlaps with what's proposed in the independent review, but is also slightly different. So a, a lot of um, very eminent minds have uh, focused a lot on what the Commonwealth does need um, to better improve what it's doing. So in that regard, I've been very interested to see the development of the Inspector General of Water Compliance. Now, this is a new statutory office. There has been an Inspector General um, of Water in the Murray-Darling Basin uh, framework up till now, but that was a non-statutory role. So as of the 5th of August, that is now a statutory role. Um, and I think this is potentially a quite significant development, but of course it's too early days to see exactly how it's all going to uh, develop in terms of, is this going to lead to greater monitoring, compliance and enforcement uh, of water law in the Murray-Darling Basin. Interestingly, um, because I understand the, the states weren't prepared to refer powers to the Commonwealth, it has had to rely on its constitutional powers in various respects in passing this which no doubt is effective. So you will see mentioned in the amendments which create all this under the Water Act to the Ramsar Convention, the Biodiversity Convention, constitutional corporations and trade and commerce, um, all of which would be familiar to those who uh, know about federal state relations on the environment um, amongst, amongst other uh, constitutional bases. But it's going to have the certainly quite impressive powers in terms of oversight and enforcement powers. So the compliance functions of the Murray-Darling Basin Authority have been transferred completely to this new statutory body. Um, it is one person, a, a, a Mr. Troy Grant, I think, has been appointed, um, and he, of course, has um, staff and officers to assist him. But he is independent, um, and the provisions in the Act make clear that for some parts of his work, um, he cannot be subject to the direction of the Minister. So the office is going to monitor and provide independent oversight of Commonwealth water agency functions under the basin plan and under the water resources plans, which are made at state level. It's also going to similarly oversight basin state agencies, which I think is the interesting development. It's going to have power to issue guidelines and standards, undertake audits, and interestingly, the criminal and civil enforcement powers are substantially expanded. And I'll just talk briefly about the criminal uh, enforcement. So there's a new statutory offences and civil penalty provisions. I'm particularly focusing on the criminal uh, on this PowerPoint in particular with a new division 3A. And interestingly, as far as I know, this is the first time the Commonwealth in the environment space has done this. It's providing for the Inspector General to take criminal enforcement for taking water that is in breach of essentially state water law. Um, and I did not attempt to try and explain to you what I think are very complex offence provisions in section 73A and section 73B. Uh, but this is, if this all comes to pass and it will be a federal judge who will be working out 
how these defence provisions work, um, this does appear to be quite significant development in the Commonwealth, in this area anyway, of the Murray-Darling Basin, being prepared to step in where state agencies um, have not. I mean, there's a whole process whereby state agencies are basically asked, are you going to be doing anything? And the state agency has the opportunity to act first. But uh, this is a backstop for that. Um, as I said, I, I think this is a fairly significant legal development. Um, and so in relation to contraventions of the basin plan, um, there is also offences in relation to water trading being added in. So with all of those um, matters in mind, it seems to me that the recommendations in the independent, independent review for an independent unit within the existing department probably isn't going to get the Commonwealth to where it needs to be in this space. Um, it really does need to consider, I think, a statutory independent body with appropriate powers if it is going to be uh, successful in truly what the independent review is encouraging it to take a much more robust approach to compliance and monitoring of environmental law. Um, I'm now just going to briefly mention, because I don't want to take over the talk that I know Professor uh, Niven is going to give you, just um, looking at, if I can manage the screen, how the Commonwealth could, rec um, could better regulate itself. Um, so, the EPBC Act does require Commonwealth activities to be assessed um, and, of course, approval can be given and conditions imposed. But once that's happened, um, compared to what happens in state jurisdictions, um, really how that activity is carried out, hopefully it's carried out in uh, accordance with the conditions of approval, for example, but if there is pollution or contamination, there really isn't any Commonwealth law to deal with that. Um, and a particular example, which I know Professor Niven's going to speak much more about, is the Department of Defence. Uh, and unfortunately, there's some recent salutary experiences with PFAS contamination resulting from firefighting, both resulting in on-site and off-site uh, contamination for neighbours um, in the Department of Defence. So the Defence Department says it pursues a good neighbour policy. No doubt it does, whereby it endeavours to comply with state law. Um, it says it's not technically liable to state law. Well, it simply is not liable to state law. And that does mean that neighbours of the Defence Department are much less protected than if they were in a situation where, for example, the state jurisdiction on land contamination did apply to them. So that is, in one way, a very clear example of where a Commonwealth-focused EPA in particular could potentially play a role, but given the absence of things like pollution control and contamination laws at the Commonwealth, um, you will have to do much more than just set up a new body. Uh, there would have to be serious thought given to how that body, what, what sort of laws that body would administer also. And another, from the Commonwealth point of view, completely no-go uh, possibility politically, uh, but I think legally makes good sense is the Commonwealth could subject itself to state law for activities on Commonwealth land, uh, because basically all the states have in place the necessary um, controls legally to deal with these kinds of activities on land. Um, and this, uh, by having uh, the state law apply it would essentially mean that neighbours of defence sites, for example, really have the same legal protection that anybody else would otherwise have uh, in a particular state jurisdiction. But I completely accept that politically may, may not be going to happen. So the last point I want to make, last but in no way least, is the culture of compliance and enforcement is absolutely essential. So just as important as exercising a statutory, uh, sorry, as having a statutory authority established is that it does act appropriately and robustly using all of its powers. And hopefully that it, its statutory duties um, are, in, are imposed on it so that it's not left up to its total discretion as to how it uh, operates. A regulatory skill set is essential among staff and of course, adequate resourcing is essential. And I give one example because uh, things can turn around actually pretty quickly. So in New South Wales, we have now the Natural Resource Access Regulator. That body was only set up, I think, right at the end of 2017. So effectively only got running in 2018. And a relatively short space of a few years, we now see far more robust enforcement in New South Wales um, in relation to water legislation, including the substantial increase in prosecutions in the Land and Environment Court. So. It shows that where there is uh, a will to create an appropriate body, um, the Natural Resource Access Regulator is also a statutory entity, 
uh, with appropriate powers and with the right kind of culture, um, you can make a su substantial difference in a short time. Those are all the comments I want to make and I'm very happy to answer questions later. And just before I leave, I do want to thank 10 terrific Macquarie University interns without whom this paper would not have been possible, this presentation, and also my tip staff, Jacqueline Turner. So thank you for listening. Hannah, you're on mute. Thank you, Katie. I was saying thank you very much, Justice Payne. You provided a lovely segue for uh, Associate Professor Robert Niven to uh, talk about PFAS contamination and the issues that that causes uh, in relation to those who suffer therefrom. Over to you, Robert. Okay, so thank you very much, uh, Hannah, for this opportunity. And I will just, I just can't share yes, my can. slides yet. Yes, so can. I've just made you co-host. All right, okay. There we are. Okay, so is that clear? Yes. Um, and you can hear me well. So I'll start. So I'm going to talk about uh, environmental contaminants. And this uh, talk actually draws from material which was used with my, between myself and a number of colleagues to argue for the formation of a Commonwealth EPA in relation to contaminated land. So I'm going to talk today about environmental regulation in Australia, particularly as regards to contaminants or pollutants and what are the major instruments for different forms of pollution. I'll then speak to environmental regulation by the Commonwealth, uh, the responsible agencies, and then I'm going to use three case studies to draw out some thoughts and conclusions, uh, particularly in relation to PFAS contamination. And then I'll go to the recommendations. So I've got a really complicated slide here. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna try and zoom in onto this slide. So this is a slide showing the major instruments for regulation of contaminated land for air pollution and for water quality. Uh, of course, there are a lot of things missing from this slide. So I haven't put drinking water, which is somewhat separate. And I've also, there's an, a number of other things happening at present in relation to recycling and waste management, which is not shown on the slide. But this is the primary uh, sorts of things that are used to regulate contaminants or pollutants. And if I just zoom onto the left, you'll see uh, the contaminated land. There's sort of like a structure here where you can see, and I've got a timeline here as well. So it all started off with, we started off with state-based criteria and regulations. And then the first document was this ANZEC NHMIC document, guidelines for the assessment and management of contaminated sites. And that was the first, basically the first national uh, criteria. Uh, it only concerned soil, it didn't concern groundwater, so it was rather limited. But then that was followed a few years later by, uh, as many of you know, the, the NEPM, the National Environment Protection Measure. And this particular one is the assessment of site contamination, 1999. And then that was also substantially expanded subsequently in 2013. Uh, there's a few other things going on here on the left, which I'll come back to. But what's interesting here is that these national documents and, and statutes are strictly only assessment, not for remediation. So not for addre actually addressing the problem, uh, which remains under state or territory jurisdiction. And we see that uh, also for contaminated land, specifically, we have this contaminated site auditor scheme which started in Victoria and then has been adopted by most other states and territories in Australia. Uh, air pollution, we have three uh, vehicles here, three different NEPMs, which I'll come back to and discuss. And much more recently, so a national clean air agreement and a product emission standards. And these are all strictly, again, in the assessment not in the remediation or control of air pollution. And finally, over on the right, we have 
are a number of documents for water quality. So we have in, again, 1992, we have an ANZAC document, water quality guidelines for fresh and marine waters. And then that was followed by, an, in fact, an international document, ANZAC and ARMCANS. So that uh, formulated Australian and New Zealand guidelines, marine and fresh water. And then parallel, which I haven't shown, there's, there's also documents on drinking water quality. And again, you'll note the structure of this is these documents relate particularly just to assessment, not to remediation or control. So to draw out some comments, um, and if I just sort of flip back here, you'll notice that this NEPM, 1,274 pages, which uh, my students enjoy, uh, because I do make them read it. Uh, it has, we have in Australia, a very comprehensive, technically demanding instrument for regulation of contaminated land. Um, you could argue that there could be improvements, but ultimately it's actually very comprehensive. So this is the NEPM. It's been co-enacted by the Commonwealth and all states and territories. On the remediation side, we have the state and territory jurisdictions, we have local councils, and for some sites, and particularly the larger ones, we have the contaminated site auditors. Now, talking about the contaminated site auditor scheme, it's interesting, uh, those of you who are interested in this kind of environmental policy, it's a deregulated regulatory framework. So we use privately accredited auditors to make decisions about contaminated land. And what they will do is they'll audit the report. So they won't conduct any of the investigations. They'll audit the reports from each stage. And that's right through the whole process, investigation, risk assessment, remediation, validation. Uh, they will order further work until they're satisfied with each stage. And then finally, at the end, assuming that the site has been cleaned up in some way, they'll issue a site audit statement which labelled in different ways in different jurisdictions. But effectively, that is a legal document which certifies that the site can be considered to be remediated. It may be subject to some conditions. The scheme started in Victoria. It's now in all states and territories. Most of the territories have their own way of accrediting auditors, but there's a cross-recognition agreement. Um, and some, some states and territories don't have their own accreditation, but they'll accept auditors from the other states. And unlike other privatised schemes, and the prominent example here, of course, is building certification, this scheme has been very successful. And perhaps some of the reasons why it's been successful is that there's quite a few measures that have been put in place to ensure the independence of the auditors from their clients or from consulting agencies. And there's a separation between the auditor uh, in charge of a contaminated site and the consultant who's actually doing the work on that site. So they're the first two sets of conclusions. I'll come back to air and water pollution a little bit later in this talk. So now we look at the Commonwealth. And if we go to the NEPM, and remember this was co-enacted by every jurisdiction, and there's a clause in there that says, that the primary responsibility for ensuring the assessment of site contamination rests with the states and territories, excluding sites owned by the Commonwealth, which are the responsibility of the Commonwealth. So that's actually very clear. Um, but when you think about what is Commonwealth land, it includes all defence land, and it also includes all major airports. It's just a curiosity of how we've done things in Australia that you can imagine every time there's, you see an airport, there's a Commonwealth border around that airport that separates Commonwealth land from the state or territory that surrounds it. And so that's fine. But then um, the NEPM itself and its originating acts do not actually specify the type of agency to exercise a regulatory function. And that is decided by each jurisdiction. And so the states and territories have nominated their EPA or their Department of Environment or some similar agency. And these things, as you know, will keep changing around. But uh, if you actually look on the Commonwealth side, you look under the Administrative Arrangements Order, which I've just done today, just to check. Um, the Department of 
Agriculture, Water and Environment, or DOOR, is responsible for the NEPM Implementation Act 1995, which means it's responsible for the regulation of contaminated land, which is Commonwealth land. But they do not appear to have any regulatory function, neither DOOR nor its predecessors, and this situation has occurred over a very long time. And for example, if we look at the annual reports that are released from the Department of Environment or its predecessors, there seems to be no mention of any NEPM at all. And the NEPC, National Environment Protection Council, only appears in the financial statements. It doesn't even discuss its function. And so we have a situation where uh, this department is missing in action. It has a statutory responsibility, which is not executing. And that means that other Commonwealth departments, so the major landowner Commonwealth departments or agencies have been forced to become their own unofficial environmental regulators. And that's the case with the Department of Defence. That's also a delegated responsibility to Air Services Australia. And also, as I'll talk about shortly, the Department of Infrastructure. Okay, now, um, I'm just going to sort of step a little bit sideways and talk about PFAS contaminants. So you've probably heard about or come across these things uh, in recent years. Uh, so these are, the acronym stands for per and polyfluoroalkyl substances. And for those of you with some chemistry knowledge, you'll see that you have this fluorinated carbon chain attached to some sort of end group and that end group can vary. So in this case, we have a carboxylic acid. In this one, we have a sulfonic acid. And, and these properties give them properties as surfactants. And historically they are used, a surfactant is a detergent. So historically they were used as foaming agents for firefighting and particularly for the control of hydrocarbon fuel fires. And they, they have some very good chemical properties for fighting fuel fires. Um, and so accordingly, there's a legacy of PFAS contamination, particularly at defense bases and airports, uh, landfills and other industrial facilities. So things like uh, fuel depots and chemical plants and so forth will have had use of these chemicals. Uh, what are the chemical properties? Well, apart from being very good for firefighting, they also bind very strongly to proteins. And well, what are we made up of is essentially proteins. And there are also a few natural processes that can break those carbon fluoron bonds. And so these compounds are highly persistent. They have a high uptake by plants, by animals, and by humans. And they have uncertain toxicity with some suggestions of connections to kidney and testicle cancers in particular. And the way that the standards have been formulated, which is the same way that standards for other chemicals are formulated, results in uh, regulatory standards that are much, much lower than for other known toxins. So for example, if we look at the drinking water standards, uh, what's considered acceptable in drinking water, lead up to 10 micrograms per liter, DDT nine micrograms per liter, but uh, this combination PFOS and PFHXS 0 0.07 micrograms per liter. And so you can see that you can drink a lead solution or a DDT solution that's almost a thousand times more concentrated than this PFOS, PFHXS in solution. So the regulatory limits are extremely low. Of course, there is some discussion about whether they need to be so low, but nonetheless, that's the, the limits as they have been formulated. And if you've been paying attention to what I've just said earlier, you will go back and look at this, defence bases and airports, which just happened to be in Australia, Commonwealth land. And so that's led to the situation that we've now encountered. So now I'm gonna talk about three case studies. And Justice Payne uh, did talk about Williamtown, so I'm going to cross over the same ground. And thanks very much for, for uh, also talking about this topic. So what we have is we have a, a RAF-based Williamtown, which is Commonwealth land, which uh, is under the jurisdiction of defence. 
There is a complication because there's shared civilian use of this uh, base as Newcastle Airport, and that is owned by two councils under a lease agreement with Defence. And so when there's a shared usage, of course, there's going to be some kind of shared responsibility. The external properties around, uh, around the base are the jurisdiction of the New South Wales EPA. The geological setting, you have um, beautiful, thick, unconsolidated sands. They're basically sand dunes, but they go to some depth, shallow groundwater. There's drainage to the south and also to the east. Um, and over on the western part of the side of this drainage over to the west. And I've made a comment here. It's actually perfect for the spread of PFAS contaminants. Nice sandy soils, high permeability. Um, it's ideal. And as insofar as PFAS contamination is concerned, there's been extensive use of PFAS AFFF, uh, firefighting phones by defence, especially in some fire training areas. There were initial concerns and multiple investigations of this problem from uh, the mid 2000s and especially from 2013. And another curiosity is there was a lack of EPA, New South Wales EPA engagement on the impacts into New South Wales prior to 2012. And I noticed that Justice Payne also discussed this as well. That um, particular issue has been subject to a separate review which I'll refer to here. So these jurisdictional problems appear to have exacerbated the migration of PFAS from Rathbase Williamtown into adjacent private lands. It's hard to be a bit more definitive than that because we also were going through, during that time, we we're going through an understanding of uh, what were these new class of contaminants. But um, I do believe that if we had have acted earlier, the problem would be less severe. Let's have a look at a picture here. So this is from uh, a consultant report to Defence. And the red line here is the RAF base. So that is Commonwealth land. And then you can see um, sort of surrounding New South Wales lands. There's a, there's a lagoon over here. There's sort of the coastal sand dunes and uh, forests over here and private land in this region through here. And you can see on, uh, superimposed on this, uh, these little square color-coded dots. So they're color-coded by contaminant concentration. This is for PFOS in groundwater. And so red is significant, and then it goes to a brown and an orange and so forth. And what you can see here is this is the firefighting area here, uh, firefighting training, I should say, uh, there's significant PFOS contamination here, and it has spread beyond the boundary into New South Wales, into these private lands here. And also there's some spread along some of these drains as well. So there's also transport by surface drainage into, into some of these areas here. So that's, that's um, Wyndham Town. Um, the next example is Rec Bay in the Jarvis Bay Territory. And so in terms of the land and jurisdictions, there are two defence bases. There's HMAS Creswell, and there's also a RAN Jarvis Bay Range facility, which falls under Commonwealth jurisdiction because it's defence land. The surrounding lands in the Jarvis Bay Territory itself actually default to Commonwealth jurisdiction as well. The JBT is an independent territory within Australia. Uh, a lot of people think it's part of the ACT, but I'm speaking to lawyers who will understand that it's actually not part of the ACT, it's separate uh, with some mirroring of legislation and some other complications. And because it doesn't have its own government, it falls under Commonwealth jurisdiction, which has then been delegated to the Department of Infrastructure. But there's also a national park within the JBT, which is jointly managed by the Rec Bay Aboriginal Community Council, because there, are, there is a community there, and the Commonwealth Department of the Environment. Surrounding the Jarvis Bay Territory uh, is New South Wales, and that will fall under the jurisdiction of the New South Wales EPA. The geological setting, unconsolidated coastal sands, shallow groundwater, perfect for PFAS. I think we've heard that before. 
Uh, so it's a very familiar type of natural environment in the coastal lands of Australia. So as far as PFAS contamination is concerned, these chemicals were used at this Jarvis Bay Range facility and perhaps somewhat less at the HMAS Creswell. There were some concerns and some investigations from 2016. There have been significant impacts on a local creek. And importantly, what is this? This has led to health and social impacts on the Aboriginal community. So they've been prohibited from swimming and from food gathering. And so as you can imagine, they've actually been separated from the land, which is the, one of the major um, features of Aboriginal life. So they've been cut off from their own land. And the jurisdictional problems here have been between different Commonwealth agencies or departments. And these appear to have exacerbated the impacts of PFAS on this Rick Bay community. So that's the second example. In a very quick summary, looking at some slides here. So the black border here delineates the Jarvis Bay Territory from New South Wales. There's um, a land border and there's also ocean borders. And then you can see here that there's, this is HMAS Creswell in here. There's a Jarvis Bay Range facility and there's the Rec Bay Village down here to the south. If we go to another map, so this shows the results of contaminant sampling. This is surface waters and groundwaters uh, in these color-coded locations. So, so color-coded um, purple and red are the highest concentrations. This is two PFASs. This is PFOS and PFHXS. And you can see there's significant contamination in some locations. And what's happened uh, is that PFAS has got down into this local creek, which just happens to drain towards this Rec Bay community here. So that's, that's the cause of the problem. Okay, a third example, which will be close to home to some of you, and that might be a little bit unexpected, uh, Sydney Airport. So the land, it's an airport and it comes under the appropriate act. And so therefore it is considered Commonwealth land and that responsibility has been delegated to Air Services Australia for contamination present on the land. There is a complication because it's operated in fact, by Sydney Airport Holdings under a lease agreement. And so there'll be a complication of uh, who is actually responsible, but nonetheless, that's the responsibility. Surrounding lands fall under the jurisdiction again of New South Wales EPA. What's the geological setting of Sydney Airport? Um, as you would expect, if you've been in the Botany area, unconsolidated coastal sands, there's some former mangrove swamps and peat seams incorporated within it. it. Has a shallow groundwater. Again, it's perfect for the spread of PFAS. So the PFAS contamination, it's been used, of course, at the airport for emergencies and for fire training. There's evidence of contamination presence from 2001. There were some investigations from 2012, which revealed significant impacts to groundwater. And what's significant here is that these reports, and there are many, many studies that have been conducted, have not been released publicly, even despite the fact that there is a national agreement that they should be released publicly. And I have managed to see some documents that were released under Freedom of Information to the Sydney Morning Herald, provided to me by a journalist. Um, those reports did not contain the figures. So, and there were some significant redactions. So, so partial information. And once again, the jurisdictional problems and this ongoing secrecy may have ex exacerbated the PFAS impacts at Sydney Airport. I think we don't know, and we don't even have the, any confidence that we know what's going on because we don't have any understanding of what the situation is currently. I can't show you a map because I don't have a map and I don't have maps of results, but um, I think you can imagine the situation. 
All right, so, so drawing those three case studies together, what are conclusions? Um, the findings are the lack of Commonwealth agency for the regulation of Commonwealth contaminated land, forcing self-regulation by each department of agency is fundamentally flawed. Um, first of all, uh, this sort of self-regulatory activity is not really the main focus of defence. It's not the main focus of Air Services Australia. They've not provided a budget for that activity, or it's just sort of an optional extra or an unoptional extra that they've has been imposed on them. They may not have sufficient expertise. Uh, certainly, uh, Defence, for example, has tremendous expertise now, but this has taken them quite some time to develop the capability. If you have self-regulation, you don't have sufficient separation between the regulator and the regulated. You have an unnecessary duplication in that you're maintaining regulatory agencies within defence, within air services, and within other places as well. And it does appear to have enhanced problems with contaminant migration off-site from Commonwealth land. And I also mentioned that there have been significant cross-jurisdictional problems between Commonwealth agencies and between Commonwealth and state or territory agencies. These problems have been partly addressed so there was, for example, there was a PFAS task force set up, which was a cross agency uh, task force, but nonetheless, these problems still persist and that task force didn't address all of these types of problems. Okay, so I'm now stepping back to this document I showed you earlier, I wanted to touch on a few other issues. So we've talked about contaminated land I also wanted to talk about air pollution and water quality. And so as far as water quality goes, um, we have this ANZAC document. Uh, there's a couple of interesting things about this and I'll just step forward. So we have a very comprehensive document. It's a very, very demanding document. Um, I think you saw there on that slide 1,256 pages in three volumes. Um, it actually provides ecologically based criteria, not criterion based. So it won't impose water quality standards based on concentrations of lead or other things. It actually expects you to go back to the uh, ecologically sound criteria. What is the impact on the ecosystem? And that's very advanced and certainly extremely advanced for the time it was written. Um, but unfortunately, it's only guidelines, it's not standards, it's not an EPM, and there's some historical reason why this hasn't been brought in under that NEPM framework, which I don't understand. Um, and that what that has had the effect that it's not taken as seriously as it should have been. And so you've had, for example, the New South Wales EPA issuing licenses for discharge to coal mines which don't actually comply with the ANZAC requirements. That I believe has been redressed, but it's taken some initiative by some of my colleagues in other universities to uh, address that situation. As far as air pollution is concerned, we have a look at these sort of, these three documents here, 20 pages, 22 pages, uh, 46 pages, 13 pages, you know, it's like they're not serious. Now, I'm not advocating that law should be long and that a long law is better than a short law um, because we know that long laws make work for lawyers, right? So, but nonetheless, um, if you're writing these things that are very, very short documents and essentially they're really only written for the sake of other jurisdictions to conduct monitoring and reporting without any standards or weak standards uh, and really not without, without any enforcement. And so Australia really does have a very weak framework for assessment and control of air pollution. There is a possibility that this could be improved through the National Clean Air Agreement, but that's state and territory dependent um, so there's some complications there and that certainly needs to be addressed. And finally, I did say I would come back to something in this 
chart is that there seems to be a little bit of rivalry going on between the environmental portfolios represented by the NEPM and NHealth, which is essentially the health portfolio. And you could call it a little bit of sort of sniping, actually, where NHealth formulates rival documents to those contained in the NEPM. And so that's interesting. Uh, the health people have very clearly put their stamp and said that they claim health risk assessment, which is fair enough, but then you end up with somewhat separate health and ecological risk assessment documents, which really ultimately lead to the same thing, and they should have many things in common, but they end up being somewhat separate. Okay, so, so that's my comment. So what do I recommend? Uh, we recommend the creation of Commonwealth EPA for regulation of Commonwealth environmental responsibilities. Now I'm here, I'm just talking about contaminated land, not other things. Um, but just going through the problems that we saw earlier from the case studies, if we had a Commonwealth EPA, then that would have some advantages that its regulatory function would be its primary focus. It would have a strong pool of expertise. There would be a separation between the regulator and the regulated. You would avoid a lot of the duplication that we're seeing with sort of regulatory functions grown within defense and air services and other places. It would have a stronger political clout in order to address some of these other deficiencies and other laws that were talked about. And hopefully it would provide uh, a vehicle for national environmental leadership. Um, and I also note, and also referring back to Justice of Pain talk, that a Commonwealth EPA would, of course, help redress other deficiencies, such as protection of species and ecosystems. And so you can sort of think of how such an agency could be structured in order to address all of these different purposes. Uh, for these case study PFAS sites, I actually recommend that the juris different jurisdictions should jointly engage a cross-jurisdictional contaminated site auditor. And then that auditor should be responsible for the totality of that site, regardless of jurisdiction. I think that would provide a, a way forward. Um, I think some of the agencies, unfortunately, though, would balk at the cost of an auditor. But I think in order to demonstrate effective management of these sites, I think this is really necessary. And finally, um, something that we see the Department of Environment is sort of jammed together with lots of different other departments in the sort of regular restructures that we see of the Commonwealth departments. But something that I don't think has ever been done is to combine the Department of Health and the Environment. And I think there could be some strong advantages for exploring that option as well, um, particularly because the medical people take health risks seriously. They're very busy with some of the, or many, many uh, of these uh, documents and recommendations. And it might mean that the department environment becomes a little bit more successful in pursuing its objectives. Okay, so that's all I wanted to say. I provide some references and uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Associate Professor Robert Niven. That was a fantastic uh, presentation that followed Justice Payne's presentation. Uh, both of the presentations are very concerning, but you've both recommended a way forward. So now we'll go to Peter Cochran, who's going to give us an IUCN update. I haven't yet seen questions pop into the chat box. I have several, but I don't want to dominate. So if you have a question, please pop it into the chat box. So Peter, um, we're assuming people have read your profile and your uh, focus, so over to you. Do you need to be, are you speaking off the cuff or do you need to be made a co-host? Uh, no, I'm speaking off the cuff. I've got a few notes here. Um, thanks very much, uh, Thank you. 
Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to, to talk to you today. Um, I come to you from um, Gadjikal and Bidjigal country and uh, pay my respects to um, traditional owners and their elders, past, present and emerging uh, of the lands uh, from which I'm speaking. Uh, I have to say just before I start that um, the last presentation that brought back uh, uh, some Kind of issues for me in that I was director of national parks for a long time and sat on the board of Booteree National Park and watched the whole PFAS issue in the Mary River catchment evolve uh, and um, the long discussions uh, fruitless to start with with defence uh, on uh, our band issue uh, and also somewhat more recently I sat on an independent planning commission panel which dealt with a uh, development proposal near Williamstown which uh, of which PFAS was a major issue that we had to deal with so um, thank you Robert for the outline of those uh, those issues um, they were came quite close to home um, can I does Hannah's invited me to just give you a quick update on what's happening in IUCN so um, like most organizations, the last 18 months has created some major pressures and realignment of work practices and program delivery uh, for us internationally. Um, I think most of you know uh, who IECN is. I don't want to labor that point, but it's uh, now over 70 years old, a major uh, global, the largest global environmental organization and unusually comprises government and non-government members. Australia has been a member since 1975. Uh, IUCN's vision, which we regularly um, um, reflect on, is a just world that values and conserves nature. Um, biodiversity loss, climate change, conflict and migration, and COVID have all intensified the need for a world to collaborate on developing and implementing solutions to these challenges that respect and protect nature and people. Key international convention meetings have been a deep, deep area of focus for IUCN with engagement with both members and others on possible and potential outcomes from two really critical forthcoming conferences of parties, the CBD, now uh, COP15, most likely in May next year in China, and the, of course the UNFCCC conference in October in Glasgow. Uh, Another major focus for the Council on which I sit and for much of the Secretariat is now has been on the much delayed World Conservation Congress, which is postponed twice from June last year. This is our governing body meeting every four years, except at the moment where it's been five years. For better or for worse, it will be a hybrid Congress with a mixture of in-person and online participation. Uh, currently, apparently, some four and a half thousand people are there in person uh, and another 1500 registered online. Uh, it's not quite as large as had been ex expected in the good days when you could actually physically be there. Um, and due to it being a hybrid conference and based in Marseille, uh, whilst uh, at local time it actually starts today at five o'clock French time, that's unfortunately 1am tomorrow morning for us who have to be there. And uh, the closing ceremony is uh, on the 10th, uh, which is actually unfortunately 4 a.m. on the 11th. Uh, the Congress is centered around three topics of strategic importance for IUCN, structuring economies in a post COVID-19 world, building a culture of conservation through new alliances and strengthening the agency of key actors, and uh, unsurprisingly, the influences of biodiversity loss and climate change on public health. Uh, building on the experience from previous conferences, and uh, the last one was in Hawaii in 2016, uh, there was a pr production of a uh, Congress document called the Hawaii Commitments. And this conference will condense its output into a short statement provisionally called the Marseille Outcomes. Also has been termed the Marseille Declaration or the Marseille Manifesto. I'm not quite sure what its final title will be, but it's intended as a strategic and focused message from the Union to a global external audience. And it's going to be focused around key three key themes, or at least as, as it goes into the Congress. Firstly, post-COVID nature-based recovery with a focus on the role of conservation and natural resources in addressing medium to long-term consequences of their social and economic impacts. A major vehicle for this will be through investments in nature, that is nature-based solutions, uh, 
which IUCN has been a champion of and has uh, set a global standard for. Uh, these are aimed at creating jobs, accelerating a just transition to a low carbon economy, to support and respect communities and positively direct private sector investment. So the scope of this could include both the immediate issues of dealing with the pandemic as a health crisis, the longer term consequences of a global recession, as well as the opportunities to reframe economic development, uh, the so-called Build Back Better agenda. The second key strategic issue is the post-2020 biodiversity agenda and the crisis that's channeling broader conservation communities' voice into the sort of ambition that's required at the Convention on Biological Diversity's Conference of Parties next year. Uh, and IUCN is also aiming to uh, position itself as a key delivery vehicle for the uh, outcomes of, uh, of that conference. IUCN has an acknowledged leadership role in supporting an ambitious agenda for the protection and conservation of terrestrial and uh, marine ecosystems by 2030, including through, uh, unsurprisingly, again, effective and well-connected systems of protected and conserved areas. Uh, currently, uh, there's a strong push, which most of you would be aware of, I am sure, uh, uh, for uh, 30 by 30, so 30% 30 of land and sea um, conserved in affected and well-connected systems of protected areas by 2030. Restoring damaged and degraded ecosystems is also a global priority, uh, also for IUCN, signaled by the UN Decade on Ecological Restoration, and restoration must be nature positive. The third key strategic area um, is the climate emergency. And the Congress will be sending key messages to the, uh, the Glasgow um, Conference of Parties on the links between climate and biodiversity crises and the options that nature offers to contribute to scaled up action, both for mitigation and adaptation, and the need to, for a coherent approach to address biodiversity loss, climate change, and land and ecosystem degradation. At the Congress, um, the second term of the IUCN president, Jin Cheng Zhang, comes to an end, and we have three candidates for president. So it will be interesting to see who leads the, um, the union for the next four years and potentially eight. Last year, IUCN appointed a new director general, Dr. Bruno Oberl, a former Swiss minister for the environment and environmental expert. Uh, and more relevantly, perhaps to the audience here, the term of the current chair of the World Commission on Environmental Law, Antonio Benjamin, who is a justice at the National High Court of Brazil, also comes to the end, comes to an end at the Congress. And there is one candidate as chair to succeed him, Professor Christina Voigt, and she's Professor of Law at the University of Oslo, Norway, and an expert in international environmental law. I might just quickly touch on the IUCN's work program for the next four years. Uh, given the nature of the delayed Congress, the work program has actually already been approved um, out of session. Um, and it has a strong focus on people and nature. People figure much more strongly in this program than previous programs, which have tended to be dominated by nature conservation. The, the uh, subtitle of um, IUCN's work program is One Nature, One Future. Uh, and uh, there are a couple of excerpts that I'd quite like to read from this as they are um, absolutely relevant here. Um, firstly, in the section on people, nature's contribution to people, both material and cultural, lack recognition and integration into decision-making. Equitable and effective governance, the environmental rule of law, and enforcement of environmental obligations remain weak in much of the world. We must close gaps in compliance and enforcement of the environmental rule of law to protect people and nature. And we must help build a global culture of conservation. The ambition for this section is a world in which a dynamic and inclusive conservation movement, effective and equitable natural resource governments, governance and the environmental rule of law and obligations protect and sustain healthy biodiversity while contributing to the realization of human rights, social equity, gender equality, good health and well being, prosperity, respect for the rights of nature, resilience to climate change, and a just transition to sustainability. Um, there are three key target areas, one of which, the first of which is. Uh, fully realized rights, roles, obligations, and responsibilities to ensure just and inclusive conservation and sustainable use of nature. 
The second one is equitable and effective governance of natural resources at all levels to benefit people and nature. And the third one is enhanced realization and enforcement of the environmental rule of law. Uh, there is a focus in the uh, work program, uh, unsurprisingly, again, on water, uh, water law and governance, and uh, similarly on climate. Uh, particularly uh, on climate, that the, uh, the responses to dealing with climate um, uh, emergency is that um, these responses will require actions to ensure the intactness and, the, of, and integrity of nature, safeguard the rights of local communities and indigenous peoples, and strengthen the rule of law, legal institutions, and tools at national and international level to ensure accountability and justice in climate change mitigation and adaptation efforts. Uh, I'll just close because I'm happy to, to, to try to take questions if there are any or leave space for others. Um, just by saying that today, uh, I believe the union is more relevant than ever as a trusted global platform that can convene diverse people and interests to form partnerships and new collaborations and provide the evidence to drive a just transition to a sustainable future. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Uh, Peter sits on the Australian Committee for the IUCN, uh, and there's an ally there for Robert, because Joe Hopkins, as a Victorian National Parks person, is always banging on about the need to combine environment and health human health. Uh, she's a very strong advocate of that, um, which is very welcome. I might just also uh, give a shout out to some of the attendees of this webinar because they have been quite instrumental in the evolution such as we have it today that Justice Payne was talking about. So you might remember that the EDO uh, was investigating water theft or acting on behalf of clients in relation to water theft in New South Wales and there wasn't much action for a year. And then they went to, uh, uh, obviously spoke to some journalists, such as Robert Niven has been contacted by, and they had that very uh, transformational Four Corners program, Don't We Love the ABC? So the topic of our uh, session today was environmental law accountability and the need for a national EPA. But where would we be without an independent media? because that uh, scathing uh, ABC report actually led to a lot of inquiries. There was an Ombudsman inquiry, there was a, a Matthews inquiry in New South Wales, which ultimately led to this uh, creation of uh, much stronger compliance prosecution uh, focus, which is most welcome. So quick reminder uh, to you that if you have any questions, please uh, put them in the chat box. Um, I might also mention that the EDO was involved in that appeal uh, development of a blueprint for national environmental law. Uh, thank you, Judith. Where would we be without the EDO? Quite. Uh, so EDO was integral to that appeal law reform pro project, as was Professor Ben Bohr, who is uh, here today. I um, was a co-convener of that uh, in name only, really, but did, did contribute actively over a number of years to that process. Um, uh, and so uh, that body did come up with a recommendation for an independent e e EPA. We have heard from the speakers how essential that is. This quagmire of our federation uh, uh, is creating all sorts of problems. Now, this is my question to uh, probably, it might be a bit difficult for uh, Justice Payne to answer this, but given the lack of trust in Commonwealth agencies, the lack of an integrity agency, the Teflon uh, PFAS approach to doing not much and the problems getting bigger and worse, um, the lack of uh, credibility in the service standards of the Commonwealth. How are we going to address that if we're going to set up a Commonwealth EPA? Peter's probably best placed to answer this because he was active at a time in the Keating government when the Mabo transformation of Australian law took place. Previously, the Commonwealth had been absolutely hopeless other than in the Northern Territory. And then suddenly we had this really transformational change in our governance in relation to Indigenous peoples and native title. So it can be done. 
uh, will it be done uh, under the current regime? Highly unlikely. There is a, uh, and Neela is completely non-partisan, but there is an, um, a lean network, labor environment activism network, I think it's called, who are advocating for an independent EDA and they, EPA and they got it in the labor platform. So post-election, who knows? Peter, would you like to answer that? Given what you've heard about um, from Professor Niven and Justice Payne about these jurisdictional complexities, which also arose in native title, is, is can you give us some hope as environmentalists? Many of us attending are students are from the NGO sector, many academics. Can you inspire us that there is some hope for a national EPA? Well, there is, there's always hope. Um... But as you indicated, the key to getting outcomes is actually political will. And the political will issue, I think, is the most challenging piece. Um, every, everything else is solvable be, because there are many smart people who can craft what is needed, but it needs to happen politically. Um, I'm just going to return to something you said earlier, which was the shout out to the EDO. And I don't think you mentioned the more, most recent case uh, where their case for the bushfire survivors of climate action uh, took the EPA to, to court, uh, to the Land and Environment Court, and to um, find that there was a legal duty to take serious action on climate change. So the role of the courts in cre creating the, the, the drive for change is, uh, or the means for change is, 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 is vital. But really in short answer to your question, unless the political will happens, and that is if there isn't the, the public push and demand for it, uh, it, it it's, it's not gonna happen because the inertia in these systems is far too great. Thank you, Peter. So this week, the ACF uh, released their uh, national survey, and they found that in every single federal jurisdiction, there's majority support for more action on climate change. Mm. So maybe those large NGOs like ACF need to be brought uh, into this space, the brown space, the, the land contamination space, and mm. this issue of national environmental standards uh, the EPBC reform process, the Samuel Review that uh, Justice Payne mentioned, talks about national environment standards, but only for matters of national environment significance, of which there should be one, but it's not. So to create standards, to bring the NEPMs into that EPBC Act national environmental standards space is a, is a long-term reform, but essential, overseen by an EPA. So I'd like to say here, uh, David Mason, thanks for the shout out to Lean. Um, but all, he would like to acknowledge our opposite numbers in the coalition uh, for conservation who have a much tougher gig. Coalition for conservation who have a much tougher gig. I didn't know they existed. Uh, well, isn't that good? <laughs> so, okay, do we have any other questions from anyone? We are at 5.22, so we've got a few more moments. Hannah, I just might add one more one more thing. And, and having left government now seven something years ago, um, it, it it sort of became quite apparent to me that that govern, government's not really an innovator in many aspects and, and has to be driven to things. And a lot of the drive for change is happening more and more in the private sector. And certainly one of the things we're doing in IUCN. Uh, and other organisations is reaching out a lot more to the private sector because investors and shareholders are demanding uh, that the issues that we all care about are addressed more effectively. And uh, many of them are being more addressed more effectively actually through the flow of funds and where finance goes. And so the, the private sector is a really, really important part in all of this piece. And for their investments to uh, have value, they need the right property rights for that, and they need the right oversight and regulation to make sure that um, you know, the outcomes that they are looking for and their investors are looking for can be delivered. So don't underestimate the pressure that can come and can effectively drive change uh, from that quarter. 
I, I think it's actually a really exciting place to be in. And uh, most recently, the Australian Committee for IUCN joined forces with Pollination, the advisory uh, firm that many of you will know, and some of you on the call, I think, are members, um, to start a series of webinars about nature risk and financial risk and uh, linking those two. And there is a uh, global task force on uh, nature-related financial disclosures. Uh, all of this is building some considerable pressure for change, and eventually governments will have to move. Thanks, Peter. That's a, a timely reminder also that the, uh, the Global Business Council for Sustainable Development, of which there's an Australian uh, branch, uh, which is a reciprocal member with NILA, they are working with professional associations in the private sector, so the, the uh, Chartered Accountants Australia, Engineers Australia probably, uh, Neela certainly, to uh, advocate for a Charter for Climate Action in the lead up to uh, action at the end of the year. But the difficulty with the focus on the private sector is that the regulatory and prosecutor prosecutorial function is really one of the state, you know, it is a government function. Mm. So it's unlikely that there would be private sector engagement in that, although uh, you never know <laughs> uh, in future forms of governance. So we have a comment from uh, Ben that uh, suggesting that Neela has a major role to play in establishing an EPA. Uh, we'll do what we can. Uh, I don't think we are taking particularly seriously, but happy to, I mean, we are, we have, we do. We are currently advocating for a national EPA. We're also advocating for a, um, for the role of this Environmental Assurance Commissioner to get out of door and to be put in the Australian National Audit Office so that it is really genuinely independent of the executive and uh, is it becomes a parliamentary officer. Um, we've looked at the New Zealand model for a parliamentary commissioner for the environment. That's unlikely to get up here, but we do want to see the ANAO take over that Environment Assurance and Audit function and given uh, Professor uh, Niven's comments about the audit uh, functions in relation to contaminated lands, uh, I don't think he said also water and air, but certainly contaminated lands, uh, that highlights the need as Neela has advocated for that uh, role of the Commonwealth Environmental Assurance Commissioner to be highly qualified in science. Uh, and there would be jurisdictional issues also to address in relation to these other um, audit functions under the uh, NEPMs. So it's 5.26, we've got a couple more minutes. Is there anyone who'd like to ask another question? I'll fill your space by just remembering that you, <laughs> you, you mentioned Marbo and um, and uh, yes, I was fortunate to be in an interesting place in the Keating government at the time. Um, but the High Court put the government in, in, between a rock and a hard place effectively, and it had to do something. So the, the High Court is a, a, a critical piece in this, perhaps. It, uh, you know, as you can create all the pressure you'd like from, from informed quarters, but in, in, until governments are forced to act, um, I th I, I, you know, there's just enormous resistance to, to change, unfortunately. Yeah, the difficulty, well, let's see what happens if this appeal in relation to the duty of care to future generations mm -hmm. and to young people currently is actually appealed and how mm -hmm. the court deals with that. Um, and if that goes to the High Court, um, I'm not sure how many of the current justices of the High Court are parents or grandparents, mm. uh, but one would hope that they are. Mm. Uh, and that might be a shame. If only we had uh, Alejandro uh, here as a justice of one of our courts, because in Brazil, he's also been quite transformative, I understand. Mm. So there are a few more comments coming in. Uh, how is it that the Catherine uh, Northwest Territory is being ignored? PFAS is a problem there. Uh, yes, there are problems in other jurisdictions. Uh, Professor Nivendi, would you like to answer that question? 
there was a class action, I understand it, in the Northern Territory. Uh, uh, sorry, what, did, what is the question? So um, why is PFAS in Catherine being ignored? There was a um, class action settlement, I understand, in the Northern Territory in relation to PFAS contamination there that affected a lot of farmers. Okay. I don't have any specific knowledge of Catherine, so I I can't just I can't just say anything. So I'm sorry that I won't, but I will have a look at the situation okay, and see you. if I can get back to the the questioner. So okay, there is a question here: Is there a role uh, for a similar body, independent or not, for a standardised system for environmental assessment and approvals on Commonwealth land? For impacts on environmental environmental matters that are not MNES. Now that's a curly question. Uh, uh, Professor Niven, do you feel able to answer that, or Justice Payne possibly? So a standardised system for environmental assessment and approval that are yeah. outside MNES. Because remember that intergovernmental agreement for the environment says that the Commonwealth is primarily looking at matters of national environmental significance. States do the rest, and Kirsty Rains, who I think is in, with one of the community legal centres, is asking, should there be a standardised system that the Commonwealth admit for, for Commonwealth land for matters that are, are, are beyond matters of national environmental significance? Yeah, no, it's, it's an interesting... I'm aware of this problem or aware of this concern. And so I understand that the different departments and agencies are responsible for their own for example, building approvals and, and development, that kind of thing. So, so that's, a, that's a big area. Um, it's not really something within my expertise, um, but this is something that I would I also have concerns about as well. Yeah. So. Comments I'm, happy, yeah, I'm happy to have a go and just say, oh, yeah. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, it is complex how the Commonwealth should deal with itself. But in a way, it is simpler dealing with the Commonwealth itself than dealing with matters of national environmental significance. So um, I think I just saw a, an email from Peter Cochran saying the EPBC Act does apply to the Commonwealth. But that's actually an easier legal task hmm. and practical task, the Commonwealth managing itself, than the Commonwealth effectively managing MNES. So it is... I don't, I mean, I'm not across all of this either. And that's why the appeal work by all those experts was so useful because they did go into this extensively. And the Graham Samuel review is also very extensive, but yes, absolutely. That could be done and should be done. Yeah, we're not, we don't have Rob Fowler with us here. He wrote that uh, technical paper too. And he had come back from a fellowship uh, and had written uh, chapters on the federal system in Canada and looked at the US system, which of course has an EPA that was largely um, gutted under uh, former President Trump, but is now making a resurgence as I understand it. I think uh, Robert Niven is a bit of an expert in that space. We should have another webinar on that topic. What happens when the political winds change with the, with the effectiveness of yeah. national EPAs? Mm. So um, it being 5.32 and we aren't, uh, so we've got a thank you there. Uh, thank you. We've got thank yous coming in. Uh, this has been a wonderful opening session for our national conference. Uh, all very high quality presentations, very educational, very stimulating. Thank you so much, everyone, all the, everyone for attending and the speakers for presenting and taking the time to develop uh, such wonderful presentations. So I encourage you please to register for our forthcoming three sessions again on a Friday afternoon. Um, what better way to get sparked up for the weekend. So thank you everyone again. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again next week on next Friday. And I'm going to end the session now. Uh, and uh, uh, we hope you've enjoyed it. So thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you, Hannah. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.